Good afternoon. Good evening to our participants in Asia and good morning to those in North America. My name is Fabrice Potier, and I have the pleasure to host the Institute's third Defense Innovation Talk today. This time, I have to admit that we have a bit of competition, as I was discussing with both before. President Biden is actually meeting his Russian counterpart as we are speaking. But the summit in Geneva also serves as an interesting pointer to our talk today. Indeed, new weapons, new systems, and technology-heavy warfare, like cyber warfare, have become one of the big contentious issues between the United States and Russia. This reminds us that now, more than ever, disruptive and emerging technologies are at the very center of the global power competitions. Government success or failure in this competition will depend to a large extent on their capacity to develop, integrate, and use new technologies to advance their national security interests. And the same applies to how democratic governments, especially NATO allies, can work together on using and sharing new technologies. Because the race for algorithm, gigabytes, and big data is also a race between democracies on one side and autocracies on the other side. So to have Bob work as our guest speaker today could not be more relevant. Bob counts as one of the leading thinkers and practitioners of defense innovation. His CV speaks for itself. As the 32nd Deputy Secretary of Defense, he played a critical role in putting innovation back at the heart of the US defense. Under the third offset strategy, Bob worked so to make the US Department of Defense better at developing and integrating new technologies and better at engaging with the private sector. Before that, Bob served in the US Marine Corps for 27 years. He then became vice president and director of studies at the Center for Strategic and Budgetary Assessments. In May 2009, he was confirmed as the 31st Undersecretary of the Navy. In April 2013, he became the CEO of the Center for New American Security, CNAS, and remained in that position until he assumed the role of Deputy Secretary of Defense in May 2014. He's currently the co-chair of the US National Security Commission on Artificial Intelligence alongside Eric Schmidt. And he's also the president and owner of Teamwork, which specializes in defense strategy and policy, military technical competitions, and the future of warfare. Bob will share his thoughts with us for between 10 to 15 minutes, and we will then open the floor for discussion. Please uh, send your questions with your name and affiliation. As, as you know, a Zoom does not always indicate those automatically. Bob, it is my pleasure to welcome you today. Over to you. Thank you, Fabrice, for that kind introduction. And it's great to be here with you today. Um, a revolution in war occurs when there is a discontinuous change in the character or conduct of warfare that renders old ways are the existing ways of warfare, either subordinate or obsolete. And they generally arrive with a major shift in the strategic balance of power. Desert Storm in 1990 was what revolutionary war theorists refer to as a defining battle in that it demonstrated or gave a hint of how this revolution was going to occur and everyone kind of understood what happened and it was the combination of guided weapons and the battle networks that employ them most unguided weapons miss their targets and the miss distance increases rapidly over range so as a result you have to have giant salvos or you have to put a thousand bombers over Schweinfurt uh, to achieve a target hit. Collateral damage was just a fact of warfare. Guided weapons would correct their trajectory and hit their target or close enough to achieve effects on target. And that accuracy was independent of range. A Tomahawk land attack missile is as accurate at, the, at a thousand nautical miles as it is at a hundred nautical miles. 
So that was a change in and of itself. Instead of firing large salvos, you could fire small salvos. Instead of sending 10 airplanes out to drop bombs to attack a single bridge, you could send 10 airplanes out to attack 10 separate bridges. Now, if you have accuracy independent of range, you want to be able to exploit that. And the only way you can do that is to have a battle network. That's the US term of art. It's not doctrinal term, but generally it's a digital network that is designed to find targets and uh, guide guided weapons. So tell, tell the guided weapons where they need to go. The Russians refer to these as reconnaissance strike complexes. The Chinese refer to them as operational systems. So the US demonstrates its revolution in war in 1990 and immediately thereafter, the Soviet Union implodes and the US is the only competitor in this new revolutionary regime. And it gains an enormous military advantage that it ruthlessly exploited through the 90s and through the early 2000s. Now, by the time I became the Undersecretary of the Navy, the military technical competition in the Western Pacific with China was changing rapidly. In terms of business speak, we were losing market share. The Chinese were becoming as good in this new revolutionary regime as the United States. And they were rapidly trying to achieve military technical parity. And that is a major problem for a country like the United States, which has to project power across broad oceans. And uh, the short term for what short hand definition of what the Chinese and the Russians were doing were called anti-access area denial networks. They were using their uh, guided munitions and their battle networks to keep US forces at bay. So when I was nominated for the Deputy Secretary of Defense, I knew that we, that the department needed to start thinking about this problem in a more coherent way. I talked at length with Secretary of Defense Chuck Hagel at the time, and Secretary of Defense Hagel de decided to announce what he termed the Defense Innovation Initiative and that was in November 2014. It was an explicit response to this developing situation where all of the great power competitors were achieving rough military technical parity in the new means of war. And it was causing the US a lot of problems in its military planning. So Secretary Hagel said, we have to jumpstart innovation. We've been at the top of our game for essentially 25 years. And a lot of our habits have been ingrained. And the only way to break those habits is to really change the rules of the game. And so he asked me to put together the Defense Innovation Initiative. And with the help of a lot of people, we finally decided on seven lines of effort to really jumpstart innovation in the Department of Defense. The first one was to develop strategies for long-term strategic competition with great powers. Uh, the Defense Innovation Initiative wasn't about winning a war, it was about preventing a war. And so the first was a strategy. He wanted, he said, look, I wanna have a clear break with the post-Cold War defense strategies, uh, one that assumes military technical superiority and I want now to assume military technical parity. And what does that mean in a long-term strategic competition? So uh, we started to work on those and they were actually completed, but they came too late in the Obama administration to make any mark at all. They were never published. So the 2018 National Defense Strategy is best thought of as the end result of this line of effort. The second thing was to develop new operational concepts and organizational constructs for military advantage. One of the key things to trigger innovation in a military organization is to say, okay, this is a new operational problem that you have to solve. And the military looks at it and says, wow, the old ways of doing business and our old organizations can't solve this problem. So we're going to have to change. 
So <clears throat> the DII understood that this, these would be a key driving force behind military innovation. And they led to a whole bunch of different ideas at the time that were just nascent. Uh, the Navy's multi, excuse me, the Navy's distributed maritime operations, the Marine Corps advanced expeditionary, ex expeditionary advanced base operations, uh, the Army's multi-domain operations, later multi-domain battle, and ultimately combined joint all domain command and control. It also started a thing called the Russia Strategic Initiative, and that was based on a, the highly successful China Strategic Initiative, which was established by Indo-Pacific Command. And what that was is it combined intelligence officers, operators, and they really try to get dive into the record to understand both Chinese and Russian military thinking and what their plans might be if they decided to take on the United States and its allies. Um, and so those started and continue to this day. Now the third line of effort was a competitive strategy to preserve and widen technological superiority. This is from business speak. Competitive strategy is a long-term action plan of a company which is directed to uh, gain competitive advantage over its rivals after evaluating their strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats in the industry, comparing their own and coming up with a strategy to redress them. A lot of people didn't understand this. I can't, a lot of people would come up to me and say, well, the third offset strategy isn't a strategy. I say, of course it is. It's a competitive strategy. It's not a military or grand strategy, that was the focus of line of effort one. So if you want a strategy, look to the National Defense Strategy of 2018. This was specifically designed to say, how do we retain military technical superiority against two highly capable um, military technical competitors? And this led to the third offset strategy. Uh, so the third offset strategy was just one of seven lines of effort uh, to try to spark innovation in the Department of Defense. In hindsight, third offset strategy became shorthand for the whole Defense Innovation Initiative, and that was unfortunate because it made it sound like the whole thing was just about technology, which it wasn't at all. The fourth line of effort was to expand wargaming and experimentation. Wargaming, we would take the operational concepts that the services were developing, we'd wargame them and we'd experiment with them and we would try to figure out which one seemed to be the most um, fruitful to explore. To spur this along, we had what we call the Wargaming Incentive Fund. And what happened was we were, this was in the time of sequestration and the services really didn't have a lot of resources and they had cut a lot of their wargaming initiatives. So we created a fund at the Office of Secretary of Defense level. And if the services came and said, hey, we would like to do a war game which explores distributed maritime operations in the Western Pacific against the Chinese, we would fund it for them. Um, and that was later expanded to include a war fighting incentive fund, which would do the same thing for field experiments designed to test new operational concepts. Both of those turned out to be pretty successful. The next line of effort was to improve capability information management. In a long-term competition like this, sometimes you develop capabilities and you would like to reveal them to competitors to strengthen deterrence. Other times you want to conceal these capabilities from your rivals in hopes of securing a warfighting advantage should deterrence fail. This is exactly what the US did with stealth in the Cold War. The US never revealed the stealth aircraft until 1989 during the invasion of Panama. A lot of people were talking about it, but we never explicitly talked about it. The Department of Defense never did. And the hope was that if war came with the Soviet Union that it would provide us with a war fighting advantage in the early part of the war and maybe one that was, would be decisive. <clears throat> but other times would we, we would reveal capabilities in the hopes of uh, deterring uh, adversaries. 
The next line of effort was to improve DODIC integration over the course from 1990 to about uh, 2014 when I became the deputy. The IC really focused on the fights in the Middle East. They had cut analysts for Russia. They had cut analysts for China. They weren't really spending a lot of time trying to figure out, okay, what are Chinese war plans? What are Russian war plans? And it was immediately apparent that the DII would fail unless we had good intelligence to drive it. The next line of effort was to expand the number of concerned stakeholders. You know, this was a major shift from what we had been doing since the end of the Cold War. So we went to Congress, the White House, defense industry, our allies, and we were explaining to them what we were trying to accomplish. Uh, this led to a thing called the overmatch brief, which was in a pictorial way showed what was happening vis-a-vis uh, -vis our competitors, uh, China and Russia. And it was designed to let people understand, wow, this is really a different environment. Those were the original seven. And I think they were quite successful in triggering a wide variety of different, uh, uh, different innovation line, uh, efforts. And then when Secretary Ash Carter became the Secretary of, the, of Defense, he added a eighth line of effort. Essentially what he, he was in Silicon Valley for the year between he was the deputy and came back as the secretary. And he said, wow, a lot of the most fruitful advances in technology are dual use technologies that are being driven by the commercial sector. So we have to plug in with them and we have to plug in with them a lot better than we have in the past. And he established what was called the Defense Innovation Unit Experimental, which was a beachhead uh, for lack of a better word in Silicon Valley. And it was designed to start getting Silicon Valley to start talking with the Department of Defense and collaborating on innovation. So the DII, I just don't think Secretary Hagel gets enough credit for uh, starting this because I can track everything that's happening in the Department of Defense right now to the Defense Innovation Initiative in one way or the other. And I think it is a, an example of how you take a large organization like the Department of Defense and you get it to change vectors and you get it thinking about a new future in which it really has to change, uh, in which it really has to change to be successful. So with that, Fabrice, I think I'll stop uh, and leave the questions uh, to the listeners. Many thanks, Bob. This was uh, incredibly relevant uh, to, uh, as I said, the overall context of this great power competition, but also to, I think, what many governments are struggling with, which is how do I bring in technology, but how do I also do innovation, which, as you pointed, is bigger than just technology alone. It's a mindset. Let, 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 let me just maybe follow up on, on some of the points you raised and, and start with on the third offset, um, what, what will you say are the most significant obstacles that you faced uh, when you brought the third offset, uh, both in the Department of Defense, but more broadly in the US government to try to bring that innovation mindset? Well, the first thing was 25 years of ingrained habits. You know, the United States had been uh, at the top of the military technical heap since the end of the Cold War. And it didn't really have to worry about uh, rogue regional powers. If the US established a battle network, uh, the outcome was pretty much assured. Um, and the second thing was we had been in these grinding wars at that time for 14 years in the Middle East. And that's what the services were really focused on. How do you fight against violent extremists? How do you uh, knock down their networks? Uh, how do you try to improve conditions uh, to suppress insurgencies and violent extremists? And that was clearly the focus of the department. It was the operational mindset. There's very few examples in history. In fact, I know of none in which a country that is fighting a hard war, 
that is really cause uh, really taking up a lot of strategic oxygen you know having everyone think about it suddenly say in the midst of that war hey let's start thinking about the next war and what we would have to do to change it's just doesn't happen it's ex extremely difficult the second thing that people have to remember is when we announced the defense innovation initiative it was right after sequestration had occurred and the services had taken enormous cuts in uh, their planned defense top line and readiness was really a problem and so quite naturally the service chiefs and the department was really focused on that problem today's readiness and so it was a combination of those two things that really hampered you know us getting started in a really uh deliberate way but things started to change immediately when secretary mattis came aboard and he said look i'm dissatisfied with the state of readiness I want you to start preparing for a long-term strategic competition with uh, what were then called revisionist powers, great powers. Uh, and we are going to start withdrawing from the Middle East. This was enormous change. And it gave the service chiefs new direction. And uh, it was constantly, we have to improve our military technical overmatch, you know, uh, the key to deterrence is to try to convince your competitor that no matter what they try, they are likely to fail. And one of the ways to do that is to try to convince them that technologically, uh, we are so superior to them that even if they surprised us, ultimately our technological superiority would help us win the day. And so that's what really started to change things. You know, I think Secretary Mattis deserves enormous credit for saying, this is the way we're going to go now. And so you see all sorts of different innovation activities going on in the Department of Defense, not as fast as I would like them, not as fast as a lot of people on the outside say, hey, you know, you keep talking about this third offset strategy, where's the beef, what's happening? I don't see any major changes, but there is just an enormous amount of innovation and churn that's going on in the department right now. And from that, you're going to start to see real changes. Interesting, because somehow the first reason you gave us is the operational mindset. The fact that when you know a big department of defense is engaged in multiple operations, there's just no headspace for thinking more strategic forward ways. Whilst I know that some of my colleagues from, from the Institute will, will, will argue that it's actually through operations that you have seen the greatest transformation and innovation, because actually you've got no choice. You've got to make things work. So, and, and you, in the beginning of your presentation, you men, mentioned the Operation Desert Storm, which was the first big display of uh, guided uh, missiles which I understand where the technology was thought through uh, or started to kind of be, be planted the seed of that technology in the second offset. So can you, I mean, can you tell us how you, you, you see operation? I mean, do you see really operation as antinomic with innovation or, or on the contrary, but it's a question of balance? Well, it's definitely a question of balance if I understand your question uh, correctly, Fabrice. You know, a lot of people thought, uh, you yeah, what Desert Storm did, only 8% of all of the munitions expended were guided munitions. They weren't a lot. But I remember vividly uh, General Storm and Norman, who was the head of the coalition at the time. He would come on every evening and he would show clips of these guided munitions going inside specific windows in a building or landing right in the middle of a bridge. Um, and everybody was going, whoa, this is something really big. So there was a big technological component to it. The, other, the thing that wasn't evident was all of the back-end stuff that was going to actually find out the intelligence, where the bad guys were, how you wanted to attack them, 
what type of weapon would you use? What type of aim point would achieve the most effects on target? All that back-end stuff that happens in the battle network you never saw. What everybody was really kind of captured by were the guided munitions. So a lot of people just said, oh, this is just a bunch of technology. This really isn't changing things. But it changed things a lot. Um, you know, it changed things in that the joint forces had to talk uh, together better. The Air Force and the Navy couldn't talk during Desert Storm. They couldn't, you know, exchange information. It was clear if you were going to have a joint uh, battle network, that the Navy and the Air Force would have to be able to pass information back and forth. They'd be able to have to pass information to the Army. This is not a natural act for any of these actors, you know. So that was the cultural thing, you know. The the services were okay. Army, I've got the ground fight. You know, you can help me in my ground fight if I ask for help, but if I don't ask for help, don't offer help. I've got the ground fight. The Air Force would say, I've got the air fight. The Navy would say, I've got the naval fight. But in this new <clears throat> regime, you would want all of them operating together seamlessly. And that was a big cultural shift. And I would look back on the 90s and say, that's what the 90s was all about, really trying to fight that shift towards joint operations and combined operations with our allies. We were much better with the joint than we were with our allies, quite frankly. Um, the 90s, we could have done, in my view, a lot better working with our allies. Um, it's, it's, so it really was a cultural shift. And once that cultural shift kind of dug in, uh, all of the, the, right now, the joint warfighting concept, the one that was just approved by the Secretary of Defense and is going to drive uh, the types of things, you know, it is called joint all domain command and control. It truly is wrapping every, everything up inside one battle network where everyone gets the information they need so that they can uh, do their fight, uh, but they do it in a very cohesive joint way. So it's very much technology plus culture. It's, it's a blend of those two things. It's, it's very interesting because I think the same applies to drone technology where the technology went live before we had even the whole basically operational concept to really maximize the potential of drones. And it took, I think, almost uh, one decade and a half to really fully employ drone in, in how we conduct operations. And, and that's a question I'm getting from some of our participants about especially from uh, Frank Hoffman from the National Defense Universities, what do you think we need to actually uh, make it better? Uh, talking about the third offset, I mean, because there's a time lag. And, and I think you alluded to that is, can we afford that time lag right now when we are again engaged in the real fierce power competition, especially vis-a-vis -vis China? So how do you reduce the time lag between when you have a new brand, you know, shiny technology, and when that technology is properly integrated in our way of conducting business. Well, remember the third offset was conceived within the framework of the Defense Innovation Initiative, which was all based on a long-term strategic competition with China and Russia. Had the Defense Innovation Initiative said let us assume that we might have a war with Russia or China within the next five years. I guarantee you the third offset would have been much different. It, there would have been a big acceleration in activity. But it was conceived of within the framework of a long-term strategic competition and a competitive strategy that plays out over time. So the way I look at it now, Fabrice, is I think back constantly, the, uh, the example I use is naval aviation in the interwar period between World War I and World War II. Everyone knew that aviation was going to have some impact on naval operations, but there was a huge debate going on on what that impact might be. There was one school of thought that said, aviation would just serve as the scouting unit for the battle line. Then there was another uh, school of thought that said, hey, uh, the aviation is going to actually be the primary striking 
power of the future fleet. And so the same thing was happening. Technology was just going along. You uh, design an airplane, build a hundred of them, they'd be obsolete because a new engine would be developed, which would allow the airplane to climb faster, go further, go farther, um, carry more. And so you were experimenting and you were constantly changing. It was very much in what we would call today the DevSecOps type thing where you're constantly changing your concepts of operation as technology changes and you're uh, doing this. So I think now you can see this starting. Uh, the outgoing Indo-PACOM commander, Admiral Phil Davidson, just recently said, look, uh, China might have the capability to seize Taiwan within the next six to seven years. And that has really caught the attention of Congress. Congress is saying, well, uh, one of the representatives who really talks about the Navy, you know, a lot of people were talking about building a Navy of 355 ships out through 2040. And one of the representatives are saying, hey, <laughs> forget about 2040, let's think about 2025. So really, it's the time frame that you're talking about, Fabrice. If you're doing this for a long-term strategic competition, you are content to allow this cycle of innovation and integrative change occur. If you are really worried more about winning a potential war that may break out within you know, the decade, you're gonna go a lot faster. And if you're gonna go a lot faster, in my view, the only way it will work is with top-down direction with the Secretary of Defense and the Deputy Secretary of Defense saying, okay, everybody drop your pencils. Here is the way we're going. I'm going to grade what you are doing and your program based on this. Uh, and you can already see this happening. Uh, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Mark Milley, recently said, look, what we're gonna do is when the services come to us with here's what we would like to procure, the key question is, is this going to help us in a war on China, against China, or will it not? And if the answer is no, it's not really gonna help because China is better than this system. He says, we won't buy it. Uh, and he says, that's not an automatic thing, but it will at least make us ask the question. So I think what you're starting to see Fabrice is a change in orientation in the department from more of, we are content for this to develop over time to more of an urgency. Um, and, you know, Secretary Mattis made it pretty clear to me. Uh, he said, look, this strategy makes my intent clear. I want urgent change at significant scale. And I would argue that we haven't seen the urgency yet. That's building. And we haven't seen the, in, the change at scale. Uh, so it all just depends. How will this play out? How will Secretary Austin and how will Deputy Secretary Hicks play this in the next uh, program? How much will they push change? Uh, I can see the urgency building now. Uh, I had not seen that before, but it, uh, in my view, it truly is starting to build. It's, it's interesting because basically what you are telling us is there's both you need to be on the long strategic game and have beef, you know, have strategic foresight and at the same time have this sense of urgency. And if you get those two uh, elements, you can indeed drive innovation and, and really have a transformative effect. And, and, and to that, I have a slightly, I would say possibly political question to put to you because I think you, you, you touch on that. Uh, from one of our participants is on the Biden defense budget. Uh, do you think the Biden defense budget is fit for the purpose you just described to us? I think the budget right now, it's early returns. We've only seen one program, I mean, one year. Uh, the Biden uh, administration did not submit the future year's defense program, which lays out a five-year plan. So all we got was a one-year snapshot. The one-year snapshot is entirely consistent uh, with a long-term strategic competition with uh, great power competitors. If you take a look, step back and say, what is the defense budget telling us? 
it is saying that, and I'm going to, the way I'll explain it, it's not the president talking, of course. Capacity is not as important as capability. We are inevitably going to have a smaller, more advanced, and highly ready joint force. That's what it's saying. We're not going to really go really quick after a 355 ship Navy or a 386 squadron Air Force or a 540,000 uh, person army. We're not gonna go in that direction. What we're gonna do is we're gonna have the largest R&D budget in the history of the department at $112 billion. We're going to go after high technologies that we think will provide us with a military technical advantage, AI, hypersonics, quantum computing, uh, you know, biotechnology, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it is very consistent. It's saying we're going to go for a smaller joint force. It's going to be more advanced and it's going to be more ready. The more ready is important for the deterrence aspect, aspect being able to fight if a war uh, breaks out. Um, so I think it's totally consistent but we, it's a very small sample side, uh, size, Fabrice. If you had the five-year future year defense program, you could see how programs would be changing over time. You would say, oh, uh, we're buying 90 F-35s in FY22, fiscal year 2022, but that's tailing down to only 48 per year by FY 2025. And you start to get a sense, okay, I really see what's happening. So all we saw was a one-year kind of snap the chalk line and a lot of people are dissatisfied with that because saying well you know what happened what about the 355 ship navy well the true answer is we don't know i mean just because we're buying eight ships in fiscal year 2022 doesn't mean we're not going to buy 20 ships next year and 25 the year after that so very small sample size right now i would say we're entirely consistent with the 2018 national defense strategy um but it is you know, constrained by the future budget. What the Office of Management and Budget released was a 10-year kind of uh, projection for discretionary defense spending. And they said it would increase by 2% per year from FY23, fiscal year 23 to fiscal year 26. And it would increase by 1% every year thereafter. What that means is it's not even covering inflation. So what that would suggest is the buying power of the department is going to decline year over year, every year through the 2020s. So obviously the uh, department has to adjust to that reality. And they say, look, we might wanna buy 500 hypersonic missiles but on this budget, we can probably only afford 250. So you'll start to see that play out. And I think you'll, in 2023, the Biden administration has said they will release the entire fit up. They will release a 30 year shipbuilding plan. Uh, we will have the uh, nuclear posture review complete. So we'll have a lot more data uh, from which we can derive answers to your question. Interesting, and and just one last question to, to close the the fir our first overall topic on the third offset. What do you regard as the biggest success or achievement to date? Uh, apart from you know, bringing this new mindset that we need to get on the innovation ladder and keep our edge. I mean, what, concretely, what do you uh, put in the category of achievement of the third offset? Well, the one I would highlight the most is in 2014, when uh, Secretary Hagel and I started talking about great power competition, people would look at us and their eyes would cross. Um, now, if you go up on the Hill, uh, both on the Republican and the Democratic side, uh, they realize the challenge that China is presenting the United States, as well as Russia, they're very attuned to the advanced technolog technologies that are really driving the competition. So in that, in that, I believe that the Defense Innovation Initiative writ large, of which the third offset strategy was a part, 
really change people's minds about the nature of the strategic competition in the 21st century. So I think that was a clear success. I believe everything else is kind of episodic. Uh, you know, the urgency, I think we could have done better on. The scale of change at this point from 2014, I would like to have seen a lot more change. But overall, uh, I think that's the biggest thing for Greece. Interesting. And, and let me now turn, broaden a bit the, the, the angle to uh, cooperation and NATO allies. Uh, we had a, a NATO summit a couple of days ago. And if you read the communique, actually, there is uh, a lot about defense innovation, new disruptive emerging technologies. And, and NATO itself has made some, some kind of commitment to get on that uh, defense innovation effort uh, to set up a new uh, fund to have some accelerators that uh, one in North America and one in Europe. So I think NATO is, is treating that question uh, much more seriously. However, there is a fundamental tension when it comes to innovation because it's fundamentally also about your you know, national economic competitiveness as a country. And at the same time, if you want to be, I think, successful, you do need to have a certain degree of cooperation. So how do you, how do you bridge that? Uh, I mean, it's interesting that you didn't mention much about US allies when you develop the third offset or when you kind of drove it, how the allies fit in that thinking and that effort, if, if you could elaborate on that. Well, you're right, as I said, um, I think we could have done a lot better on the uh, combined allies front. We talked a lot like at uh, Allied Command Transformation and uh, we talked with uh, allies on bilateral uh, nature. And the key thing in the third offset strategy is we're looking for a higher level of autonomy uh, powered by artificial intelligence. <clears throat> the first and most urgent thing that the allies have to do is have a kind of common agreement uh, on what they will tolerate in terms of artificial intelligence and AI enabled autonomy. There are definite differences between the way the EU and Europe think of uh, AI and the United States at this time. And that's where I would start Fabrice. We need to have high level military technical consultations on, okay, what do we really think about autonomous weapons? Uh, what type of autonomy, autonomy will we tolerate in our weapons? Uh, because all of this will determine on the level of interoperability that we would have if we start to operate together. Uh, it's always more difficult to create a combined battle network than it is a national battle network because you have all different levels of multi-level security. Uh, you have to really work to plug national networks together, it's a hard, hard problem. And so at the big level, I think we should be talking about, okay, what do we think of this era of algorithmic warfare, where algorithms and AI and big data and the cloud, the internet of things, all of those things are going to change war in some way, just like eight we know we knew that aviation was going to change naval operations. So we know algorithmic warfare is going to change operations in some way. How do we conceive about that? Where do we want to go? Where are the uh, guardrails that we don't want to cross? We need to get that settled down between allies at the top level. And then we start to have real detailed technical, uh, technical discussions on the data standards, uh, the information uh, transfer standards, all of those things so that if God forbid war ever did come uh, with the Russian Federation, we would be able to operate as a truly cohesive coalition rather than individual national uh, battle networks. That is a tough problem. Uh, so those would be the two areas where I think we should start right away. 
and both of them, in my view, would lead to better interoperability over time. And especially tough because in the uh, commission that you have been co-chairing, the uh, US National Security Commission on AI, you've been co-chairing with Eric Schmidt, I understand that one of the lead recommendations is indeed that AI should be, I, I think you're pushing the envelope on the AI uh, thinking inside the, the Department of Defense, much more than what has been, what is the current status quo. So uh, how do you see that, you know, factoring in into what the current administration is trying to do by working with the European allies when in the US, you actually, the consensus might be already shifting and going a bit further in terms of use of autonomous weapons and so on. Well, this is, this is a hard problem because uh, the military office, the military officers who lead any military organization are naturally conservative. And they are reluctant to make major changes until they understand the technologies and they conclude in their own mind that these technologies will improve their ability to conduct operations and to prevail on the battlefield. It's difficult on the AI because up to this point, a lot of it has been theoretical. We don't have a lot of applications that uh, we can actually show to warfighters and say, look, this is going to improve the way that you operate. That was real easy in the second offset because you would go to an officer and say, hey, uh, you know, how would you like to have weapons uh, that reliably hit within 10 feet of the target, regardless of range. And it would take one second for the military officer to say, I want some of that. Give me some of that. That sounds really good. Um, and it's difficult for us to come to them and say, look, this AI enabled application is going to really change things. But we know that the AI applications are going to change things just by what's happening in the commercial world and how rapidly things have changed in computer vision and how rapidly changed things have changed in natural language processing and how natural things have changed in uh, uh, predictive indications and warning. There are just all sorts of changes going on. But until we have experiments which validate and verify how these systems will work repeatedly so that the commander has a good idea of what they will do on the battlefield if the commander decides to employ them. Um, and then we would do field uh, exercises in which the whole force starts to see how these things operate. And at that point, once you get an understanding within the uh, service, how things are gonna change, things really start to happen a lot faster. Um, there was just recently an experiment uh, in which <clears throat> an AI decision aid was used in a series of 30 war games. And the war games were against two, you know, the blue force friendly, the red force uh, bad guys. Statistically, they were designed so that they had military technical parity and had an equal chance of winning in a straight, you know, stochastic model, uh, you know, bump, chunk, 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 chunk. These guys win this one, these guys win other ones. And what they did, it was very, very interesting. They took a bunch of players that had an average experience level of nine years in the military. So let's call them senior captains, junior majors. And they played them against military officers that had 29 years average military experience. So these are most likely colonels or maybe even brigadier generals. <clears throat> but they gave the inexperienced players an AI tool that would recommend to them courses of action. The AI tool wasn't directing the fight. It was recommending course of action to the what were called centaur players. And it turned out in the 30 games, uh, I think the final score was 16-14. And you look at that and you say, wait a second, what has happened? A whole bunch of inexperienced players working with AI 
essentially fought a whole bunch of experienced players to a draw. To me, that's pretty damn significant. Um, because the Chinese, the Chinese always uh, write about, look, the United States has a lot more operational experience than we do. But if AI can level that playing field, then what the Chinese are saying is, let's try to take that advantage off the table and make it more, uh, uh, make it more fair for us and make it more likely that we can win. Now, <clears throat> the thing that they used in the game was really clunky. You know, it was just... Uh, it has a lot of work to go, but it gives you an idea. It gives you an idea of the whole idea of the third offset, by the way, was making humans better. We referred to it as human machine collaboration, which was autonomy and software, which would make predictions and give the predictions to the humans and the humans would use them to make better, faster, more relevant decisions. And then human machine combat teaming in which manned platforms would operate together with unmanned platforms <clears throat> to conduct operations that they couldn't have conducted in the past. So it was really all about empowering the human, not turning everything over to the machine. And so I think a lot of people worry that, you know, the third offset was all about creating Terminators and Skynet. And that was as far from the truth as you could possibly be. This was really trying to empower warfighters, human warfighters uh, to do better uh, on the battlefield. <clears throat> you you uh, usefully brought up China and that was uh, something I wanted to touch on before we, we close this very interesting uh, uh, talk and, and discussion. What is your assessment of how the, the PLA is, I would say, achieving on the defense innovation scale? Um, you know, there's a lot of speculations about, uh, indeed, China being quite ahead in integrating AI in how the PLA will be able or is currently able to conduct, plan and conduct operations. It's not been tested, or at least we have not seen it tested live. But so what is your assessment of that? And then connected to that, um, do, you, do you think we just need to have, we have one big operation from convincing those who are still reluctant to embrace those new technologies in the West, uh, we are one big uh, operation away from, from basically realizing that the others, mostly China, but to an extent Russia are already far ahead. <clears throat> Well, first of all, the way <clears throat> people will come to the uh, commission all the time and say, who's ahead? Is China ahead? Is the U.S. ahead? And the way we uh, decided to do it is we said, look, AI isn't a specific technology. You have to think of AI in terms of what we were called the AI stack. And the AI stack has six components. It has data, uh, which drive <clears throat> are used by machine learning algorithms, uh, talent, uh, you know, people who are digitally savvy can write the algorithms, can do all of those things. Um, the algorithms themselves, writing the algorithms, applications, taking the algorithms and applying them to a specific problem, the hardware, the chips on which the uh, uh, applications and algorithms run, and then integration. And we tried to look at all six layers of the stack and we concluded that China leads in three of the six, data, um, applications, and integration. Data because they don't care about civil liberties or privacy. If, they, if the data is available to them, they will take the data and they will use it. And in the West, of course, we respect personal privacy we can't use data as freely as the Chinese. So that is an uh, a, uh, advantage to the Chinese. And the example we thought about was healthcare. HIPAA rules in the US prevent us from just going out and saying, give us all of the health data of all Americans so that we can design an algorithm to predict Alzheimer's disease. Um, and we can't do that because HIPAA prevents us from doing it for a good reason. 
Americans don't want that data just being used by the government uh, for uh, their own purposes. The Chinese will just take the data. And so that gives them an advantage in healthcare algorithms because they have an enormous pool of data. We think they're ahead in applications at scale. They're very, very good at putting out things. They're working on smart cities. They're working on autonomous vehicles. They're working on autonomy in the biosecurity sector. And their applications, we think they have sped applications to the field uh, faster than we have. And then they lead in integration, not because they're better at integration than us, but because they have a national strategy to dominate in the technological field. They have a specific national goal to be the number one technical power in the world. That leaves the US, we think, has an advantage in algorithms, talent, and hardware. So you look at it and you say, okay, they're ahead in three, we're ahead or slightly ahead in three. It's kind of a dead heat. But when you look at the three categories that we rate ourselves as being ahead in, and when I say we, I'm talking about the West more general, generally, not just the United States. For example, in hardware, the United States, Netherlands, and Japan corner the market in the fabricating machines to make microchips. Uh, so that's an enormous advantage to the West uh, in this technological competition. But those three, talent, uh, hardware, and algorithms, lead us to believe that we're slightly ahead in the competition right now. But it's so close that it's hard to tell who's, who's ahead. And as you would say, in this regard, you can't fly over like you did the Soviet Union with your satellites and count the number of ICBM silos and say, oh, they have a thousand ICBMs. You can't fly over the Chinese uh, military and take pictures of their airplanes and say, oh, those airplanes are all AI empowered. You just can't do it. So in this regard, we, we need to prepare ourselves for operational surprise because if we ever did come up against the Chinese and the Russians. The Russians are spending a lot of money on combat robotics. The Chinese are using AI far more generally. Um, and there was a report this morning that the AI pilots right now are being trained against AI. Uh, I mean, Chinese combat pilots are being trained against AI uh, enabled drones and it is improving their performance. So the Chinese appear to be using AI far more broadly than the Russians. And I think that's an indication of their superior technological base. And the Russians appear to have focused in on combat robotics. We have to prepare our force for operational surprise because we might not know uh, that our uh, potential adversaries have really exploited AI until we go up against them. So this is what we know, Fabrice. The Chinese have a national strategy to be the number one technological superpower in the world by 2030. They have a national plan to get there. They believe that yes. that will allow them to leapfrog the United States, both in terms of economic competitiveness as well as military power. They've spent 1.5 trillion conservatively so far to get to where they want to go. The United States and the West more broadly do not have a national strategy to win that technical competition. That's what we concluded in the commission. We are clearly able to win this competition if we embrace the competition and go after it. Uh, but right now, uh, as I said, the US and the West are simply being outcompeted uh, by the Chinese in particular in this technical competition. That's very interesting. And, and I, I do agree that looking at the three uh, tracks where the Chinese are, according to your assessment, ahead of us, uh, data, uh, large-scale applications, and, and integration via a, a grand strategy. It's indeed a grand strategy where 
I think the US, but more broadly the West can can regain some some uh, some advantage and and can kind of get its act together because on data I think we are heading, including in the US, towards still uh, some restriction on how you collect and how you manage data. Yeah, Large scale absolutely. application is linked to the first one, so I think here I. I I, I don't see us being able to 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 follow that closely uh, the Chinese and 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 I think it was great that we concluded on on China uh, for the simple reason also is our next uh, defense innovation talk will be on China with an amazing panel of three of the best uh, China experts uh, so uh, we look forward to that but uh, just to conclude I wanted to thank you Bob for your time it was very interesting very broad uh was great to have your your take on both the us and and the great power competition uh, we are in so thank you very much for your time and i look forward to staying in touch well it was definitely my pro uh, pleasure fabrice and it was great to talk with you this morning thank you okay bye bye, bye.